Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to present Dialogger, an application using quantified self to help type 1 diabetics manage their chronic condition. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. I'm Erin. I'm Rachel. And I'm Anna. And as he said, we're here to talk to you about Dialogger, a mobile application to help type 1 diabetics manage their chronic condition. So I want to take you all back to 16 years ago um, to my own personal D-Day. It was around August 2001, my entire life changed. On this day, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I was six years old at the time. Um, this, not, this diagnosis did not only affect me, but it affected my entire family and friends. It affected anyone I came in contact with, including people at school. At this time, I had to learn that I would live and survive by injecting myself with insulin, which is a human-produced medicine um, that is a substitute for what your normal non-diabetics produce with their pancreas. So imagine being told that you were diagnosed with a disease that was, in that was incurable at the time. It's a lot to take in. Believe me, I would know. It's a lot to understand that you have to learn to live a different way at the time. And the following years following my diagnosis was filled with a lot of trial and error. Um, I had to learn that, you know, hospitals weren't as scary as, you know, you may think they were at six years old. I also had to learn that um, nurses aren't as, you know, staff in a, in a school. They became my best friends as I had to go to the nurse frequent. I had to go and see her once a day throughout middle school and high school. I had to learn that before eating that slice of cake at parties, I had to check my blood sugar. I also had to learn that I had to carry around extra supplies for, for me in order, uh, in case of an emergency or in case I need to check my blood sugar or in case my blood sugar went low, I needed a juice box. I also had to learn that the new norm for me was to check my blood sugar using a device like this, which um, is a little, to get the blood drop, I had to prick my finger five times a day at a minimum. And that blood drop would be inserted into a strip, which um, inserts into this device, which is called a blood glucose mo um, monitor. This monitor displays a screen within five seconds. That number that you see on the screen kind of determines how your day is going to be. So at the start of the day, if your blood sugar is low, it kind of ruins your entire day. Or if it's high, it's safe likewise. This small number may not mean a lot to many people, but to me it kind of determines how my entire life will be. To non-diabetics, a blood glucose can range from 80 to 100. But to diabetics, my blood sugar can go as low as 18, which has happened before to as high as 510, which is what it was when I was diagnosed. These highs and lows are pretty dangerous and they're also really life-threatening. So when your blood sugar goes low, I can go into a state of hypoglycemia. This often happens when I take too much insulin, I miss a meal, or I overexercise more than I plan to. During that state of um, being, I get really shaky, I get, personally I get really sweaty, and I get really delusional. So I'm not really there in the state when my blood sugar is pretty low. It's also dangerous, especially at night. So at night, you're, when you're asleep, if your blood sugar drops, you can risk life um, as well as um, organ complications. Hyperglycemia is kind of on the opposite scale, so it's when your blood sugar is really high. For diabetics, a high blood sugar means above 200. So when my blood sugar was 510, it was pretty serious. Um, this often, often occurs when you eat too many carbs or when you miss your medication. As you can see, the symptoms of hyperglycemia include dry mouth, um, dehydration, and during hypoglycemia, you have the risk of going into ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis occurs when the body kind of slowly starts to shut down and it produces acid in your stomach. At this point, you have to go see a doctor and you have to get an IV and get medication. As these, you can tell, these highs and lows are pretty dangerous, and I try to avoid these fluctuations as much as possible. Luckily, thanks to modern medication and science, I'm able to choose a treatment plan that best works for myself. Starting out, I used a needle, like the top right, and I would fill that needle up with insulin from a vial, as you can see in the middle, with insulin that's um, be injected into my body. I can inject it into my leg, my stomach, or my arm. I had to inject it before a meal, if my blood sugar was high, or if I needed to correct for any other factors. Luckily, I got to switch from taking shots 12 times a day to wearing an insulin pump, which is a beeper looking like device, as you see in that picture. It's attached to my body 24 seven, 365 days a year, no matter what. This, kind of, this device helps me to function as a, much as a normal human being as I could. And as great as these medical devices are, 
they aren't um, those as great as a human working pancreas. They still <coughs> fail more often than you'd like. For example, last night, um, my pump died in the middle of dinner and I had to drive all the way back to my apartment to get um, a charger just to charge my pump. So it kind of ruined my dinner, ruined the night. I, it kind of just messed everything up. So as unfortunate as this is, it's something I have to live with. Um, as you can see, it's a big impact on someone's life. So currently, at the age of 22, just ready to graduate college, I would have lived over 5,700 days with diabetes. I've lost over 3,200 hours of sleep, which often occurs when I wake up in the middle of the night and my blood sugar is low. When I wake up in the middle of the night and my blood sugar is high. Those take around two hours to correct. So I have to be up in the middle of the night for two hours until my blood sugar is steady and I'm okay to fall asleep again. I've also done over 34,000 finger pricks and over 1,400 insulin pump site changes. These numbers may seem like a lot to you all, but to me it's kind of a state of fact. It's my impact that diabetes has had on me at this point in my time. I'm not even halfway done yet. You know, I'm not, I haven't even graduated college. So imagine at 82, <laughs> I would have lived over 29,000 days with diabetes, lost over 17,000 hours of sleep, and done over 179 finger pricks and over 8,000 insulin pump site changes. This is a lot to take in, but to me it's kind of what I look, don't want to say look forward to, but it's a state of fact. It's what's going to happen. In order to combat and mitigate myself, mitigate my numbers, and in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle, I luckily get to go see a special doctor that I call a diabetes doctor. Um, scientifically, they're called an endocrinologist. These endocrinologists are specialized in type 1 diabetes especially. I get to go see this person twice a year, every six months. Before the appointment, I'm told to keep track of my numbers. I have to keep track of data. And at six years old, this is kind of a lot to take in. So this data includes blood sugar levels, insulin intake, carb intake, and the times <coughs> it takes. When you're in middle school and high school, that's a lot to remember, that's a lot to write down. At the time, my best advice from doctors was to carry around a sheet like this. This is called a log sheet. It's pretty typical that most diabetics get. So I would carry around this log sheet, fill my information in, and that would be how I kept track of my data. To many of you all, it may seem like a bunch of numbers, scribble scrabble, and like letters and writing. But to me, these log sheets are what determine what I inject myself into my body. These log sheets are what doctors use to decide how much insulin I should be getting myself <coughs> daily, weekly, for my entire six months in between appointments. It's kind of crazy that a piece of paper is what determines what I inject myself into and how I should live my life. Growing up in middle school and high school, especially during those hormonal preteen years, it's kind of awkward to carry around a piece of paper, writing stuff down kind of like a little scientist when you're not even you know, 12 years old. Especially during those times, I wasn't able to accept the fact that I was a diabetic, so trying to hide that was pretty hard, especially carrying around a bulky piece of paper and binder full of this type of information. This is kind of the premise behind Dialogger, and it's a story that we hope um, you guys will follow us through. And next week, I'm going to hand it off to Rachel, who will talk a little bit more about why Dialogger is so important. Um, now I'll be talking about chronic disease as a whole. Um, it's a long-term disease. Um, it is. Uh, it is grossly neglected as a um, global health on the global health agenda. Agenda, um, according to the CDC, it's predicted by 2020 uh, that it will be the leading cause of death for children, which is sad. Um, chronic disease is also known as a non-communicable disease since um, it's not passed from person to person. It is uh, also um, the leading cause of death and disabilities um, in the United States is unfortunate as well. Um, also, um, it's under the umbrella of an invisible disability since it's not um, visibly apparent that someone has um, a chronic disease. Unlike someone who might be like nearsighted, um, they wear glasses so that's like instantly recognizable that they have a disability. Um, here are a list of a few of the chronic diseases. Um, unfortunately, those aren't all of them. There's a bunch more out there as well. Um, most of these are also autoimmune dis uh, diseases, like type 1. Um, an autoimmune disease is when the person's body attacks its own itself um, because it thinks it's like a foreign object or so forth. Um, and then uh, you might be wondering what the difference is between type 1 and type 2. Uh, as you can see, with type 1, there's an unknown trigger for it um, compared to with type 2. It's typically either genetic or due to lifestyle habits, such as um, lack of exercise or poor diet. Uh, 
it is, uh, like Anna said, there's a, uh, with type 1, the treatment is daily insulin uh, intakes, um, as compared to type 2, where you typically use, take a medicine like an oil pill or so forth. And then um, type 1 is also known as like adolescent disease, since it, um, people like Anna are diagnosed with it at a young age, like for her age 6. But with compared to type 2, it can, um, be, anyone can be diagnosed at any age, either as young as 6 or as old as 60 and so forth. Um, there's no known prevention for type 1 diabetes. Um, however, with type 2, it is preventable due to like your lifestyle habits and choices. Um, last but not least, type 1 is not curable, unfortunately. But with type 2, um, you're able to mitigate it by eating healthy and choosing healthy uh, lifestyle habits. Um, with type 1, it is uh, an autoimmune disease, as I said before. Um, it's basically where the, um, the person's body is, an a is not able to produce insulin, which is a hormone that is needed to um, carry gl uh, glucose to the rest of your uh, body. And glucose is a form of energy that your body needs in order to function. Um, the red arrows indicate that the person's body is attacking its own pancreatic beta cells. Um, with that, the dark circles indicate that um, the person's body is, uh, the insulin producing beta cells are dying, and because of that, they're having a high level of uh, blood sugar. Um, with this map, you can see that <coughs> type 1 diabetes, I mean, diabetes as a whole is not just a problem in the United States, it's a global issue as well. Um, from this map, you can see it is predicted that there will be a staggering about 50% increase of people diagnosed with diabetes in about 35 years, which is a lot. <coughs> um, 14.9 billion, like wow, that's a lot of money. Um, that's how much a person with type 1 diabetes spends on healthcare costs per year, which is pretty evident with how much um, medical supplies Anna has to use on a daily basis. So with all that Rachel and Anna have told you about diabetes, you're probably thinking that there must be a solution already out there. There <coughs> must already be an application. And there are applications out there, but they only take into consideration these three factors, the blood glucose level, insulin intake, and carbohydrate intake. Which as you saw in Anna's log sheet, those are the three numbers over one week of time that a doctor gets to see into that patient's life. And that's the information they use to come up with a treatment plan for six months. What makes Dialogger different is it takes those three factors into consideration as well as stress, activity levels, and sleep, which gives doctors a much bigger picture of their patient as a whole and they can individualize the plan for them. There's a major opportunity to identify trends between these six factors, both for doctors and for the patient themselves. They can see the numbers and they can ident self-identify the trends so that they can prevent highs and lows in the future. Um, as Anna also mentioned, there's a lot of trial and error now with doctors because they only get a week and they say, okay, well, we'll try this dosage. And if a week later they wind up in the hospital, they have to try again with a different number. So that we're hoping that this reduces the amount of trial and error necessary. We wanted to integrate the quantified self into the app. If you aren't aware, the quantified self movement is also called life logging, and it's integrating technology into our daily life, keeping track of numbers, our steps, heart rate, sleep, and all those kinds of things. So many people already do this with a Fitbit, a smartwatch, or another wearable device. So the information is already out there, and it is relevant to diabetics. So we decided to integrate a Fitbit into our app to help identify even more trends. So right now, the app focuses on patients. So they can self-identify these trends, and they can be more proactive and know when they can eat, sleep, and basically how they can live their life. The next step would be communication with doctors so they can see these levels and help come up with a proactive treatment plan. And then beyond that, Dialogger could be used as a big data collection system to help identify bigger trends better treatment plans, and ultimately, hopefully, a cure. Now, Anna's going to do a quick de uh, demo of Dialogger for you.
just log it into the phone. <laughs> they all have iPhones, and it's really hard to develop with iPhone, but it's really easy on Androids. That's my Android. It usually only opens with my thumbprint. So. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So as you can see here, we have the mobile app right here. You're going to click on it. And when you first click on the app, you're welcomed through with a walkthrough. So when a new user downloads the app, um, they'll be kind of given an informa informative uh, walkthrough and tutorial on how to use the app. So when you scroll, this kind of tells the user, you know, that we have tabs and which we'll be seeing later on. Um, it's pretty <coughs> informative and we just thought this would be helpful for people to, you know, get a feel of what the app is before they actually dive into it. So again, this is another just informative um, screenshot of what the app will be like once the user logs in. So here we're going to log in real quick. So once the user logs in, um, they're navigated to the home screen. The home screen is pretty simple. This was kind of our design behind the whole, our idea behind the whole process. Um, the design is pretty simple on purpose so that users can minimize the number of clicks it takes to um, input any you know, data or information, when, especially when people are on the go, which most of us are on the go nowadays. So this first um, screen, you can see that at the bottom, there's a BGL, blood glucose level, oop, carb intake tab, sleep, and a trends tab. So I'm going to go through each tab trying to show you guys what each tab does and why they're important. Here you can see that you input your blood glucose level. So if I were to check my blood sugar, I would check it, say I got, you know, blood glucose level of 100. I would input 100 right here. And then I, if I had to give myself insulin, I could do the same with the give myself insulin right there. So once the user's done, they, they <coughs> press enter and input that number into the database. Along with that, we have our carb intake. So if I were to eat a meal, um, I could say I ate, you know, a breakfast, lunch, dinner, or a snack. So if I ate a snack, I could click on snack and enter the amount of carbs I ate. So it could be, you know, average snacks around 12 grams. Um, so I would enter the 12 grams, and then once I'm done, I would enter into the database. You can also specify what exactly you ate. This is useful, so when you do look at the stuff later on, you can specify that pizza does give you, you know, oh, I did 500 times. <laughs> okay, well, imagine it was a big snack, but, um, <laughs> So if I did eat a pizza pretty often and I noticed that my blood sugar levels were rising pretty often when I ate that pizza, that'd be kind of an indication that maybe I should not eat pizzas that often. It's kind of hard in college though. <laughs> <laughs> so next up we have sleep. So sleep is kind of an important factor that a lot of people don't keep into consideration. Um, when diabetics don't get enough sleep, it's harder for their body to take in the medication insulin. So it takes them a longer time to take the medication in, which affects their entire, entire um, blood sugar throughout the rest of the day. So here you can enter your start time, your end time, and this is kind of the important factor where you can say you either slept sound, you were normal, or you're restless. So a restless night would be like if I woke up in the middle of the night with my low blood sugar. I would highly consider that as a restless night as I was up for two hours. Um, <coughs> on our last tab, you can see that we have the trends page. So here we have um, a visualization of you know all the data on one view, so this kind of helps the user kind of see that, you know, what is affecting what, um, in what situation. You can also, you know, cancel out certain things if you want to only look at one trend at a time. So here you're only looking at the total carbs and the stress levels. The top left, you can see that we have our little menu. Once you click on the menu, you see again that we have, once again, the four factors, blood glucose level, food, sleep, and stress, um, again. These pages are more of a history-like pages. So when you go to each page, this is more of looking at the past input you have done with it on the first page. So here you would see your past um, blood glucose levels, when you inputted it, um, and you can select a range that you would like to see. So for 24 hours, 48 hours, a week, or a month, that kind of helps the user um, more like pinpoint the point where they want to see. So if you're at a doctor's appointment, you can show them way more than just the <coughs> last week's worth of data. So I'm just going to show you each page. We'll go to food. It's, they're all pretty much the same, just different, the, again, the different factors. And here we have some sleep. And stress. 
So on another note that we have about our app is that we have the account. So for each person, they can input their high, lows, and goals of their blood sugar. So for me, um, my personal high target, I don't want to go any higher than 200. It depends on person. For little kids and younger kids, it might be you know closer to 150. Um, my low for me is 50. I don't want to go below 50 or else you know that's danger zones. Um, ultimately, each person's goal is different. For me, um, I'm told my goal should be around 120. Um, and then going further, each person's account has, you can put input their own information. So you can put your age, weight, and height. We do want to like point out that weight isn't an important factor within this app. Many apps do point out that you know weight is a uh, end-all be-all for diabetics, but in this app it's not. It's more of a what the actual factors we have um, on the other pages. So lastly, I'll take you guys to the settings page. Here we have the notifications and the Bluetooth settings. And importantly, we have the quantified self um, aspects here. We have the Fitbit connected. So you can connect your Fitbit, which we already preset, pre-connected the Fitbit. Um, you can also add another device, but the Fitbit is connected already. So then we'll show you that. It should show up. Yes, I thought we had to go back and forth. Yeah. Time. There we go. So now that the Fitbit's connected, you can kind of see <coughs> um, how many hours a person's sleeping and the efficiency of that sleep. And that's data we all we get from <coughs> the Fitbit. So this is data that's pre-existing that users can use to you know help themselves out within a, in a one user interface, which is our app. An important aspect we also wanted to note is that. This app is also very simple due to the fact that most diabetics are juvenile. They're under, you know, you're diagnosed pretty young. So whether it's, you know, a middle schooler or a high schooler using this app, it's pretty simple to understand. It's pretty simple for a user to not have a misstep or misinput data because it's so simplistic. It's also simple for older people because many, many times parents, like my parents, had to keep track of my numbers at a younger age. So that's it. We hope you enjoyed the demo. So you may be wondering how we did this. Um, to start, we made the front end of the app. We did this using the Ionic Software Development Kit, which uses the Angular framework. Um, we also used these four programming languages, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and TypeScript. We then connected the, the app to Auth0, which is an authentication service provider, which is a much more secure way to hold our users' information. We then connected that app to a Mongo database, which is a NoSQL database, which was a little bit of a challenge for us because we all the databases we had used in the past had been SQL-based. And then we stored um, everything on our production server on DigitalOcean, which is kind of in the cloud, which is something you may be more familiar with. And this is really useful because if you were to kill your phone, delete the app, um, you would still be able to download it again and log in and your information would still be there. It's also useful if you had multiple people using the app. So if Anna had the app and her parents had the <coughs> app, they could both be entering information and be keeping track of it that way. So that was a lot. Um, how easy was it? There were a lot of trials <laughs> and tribulations. There was a very steep learning curve. Um, all of the technologies I talked about on the last slide were brand new to all of us. Um, it was a lot of self-teaching with the help of our advisor, um, a lot of online tutorials, YouTube videos, um, late nights. Um, we also all have different operating systems that we were doing the coding on. So what worked for me didn't necessarily always work for Rachel and Anna. We also came into this with different background knowledge and probably the biggest, um, the hardest thing for me but also the most rewarding was that we did the design process from start to finish. So coming into this, Rachel and I didn't have a lot of experience with type 1 diabetes and didn't know a lot about it. So we got to do a lot of research, learn what a typical day in the life of a type 1 diabetic is like, and then try to design an app around that, one that would actually be useful and helpful for that person. Um, and then figuring out how we were going to code it, do the coding, connecting it to a database and a server. So we really got to do the whole thing start to finish. So what's next for Dialogger? You saw Dialogger today, it's focused mainly on the patients. Uh, we have two gentlemen, Jeb and Jonathan, that will be taking over for us. 
They're graduating in, graduating in December and they're going to be extending Dialogger's ability to communicate with doctors. And then we have two other gentlemen taking over for us graduating in May that will be creating a predictive model to help, to use the data already in the app to help the patient come up with, um, to kind of alert them if their levels are in danger of going too high or too low. There's also a lot of opportunity beyond that. So if you're a sophomore looking for a project, um, there, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity with like big data analysis um, <coughs> if you're interested in doing something like that. Um, first and foremost, we would like to thank our advisor, Dr. Morgan Benton. He was always ready to jump in and put out the fire, so to speak. Um, he went above and beyond as an advisor, um, not only meeting with us on a weekly basis, but also meeting with us um, every Sunday of the past month to make sure we were ready and prepared for today. Um, without his guidance and support for the past two years, this project would not have been possible. We'd also like to thank the ISAT department. Without this department, we wouldn't have been able to um, challenge ourselves to do such a project just as this and be able to go through the experience of having done a capstone, especially through their continued support and funding of the devices that we needed for the project. And last but not least, we'd like to thank our family and friends for their continued love and support throughout the whole project, but also our whole education. Um, thank you for coming and listening to us today. Uh, we'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Mongo is unstructured data. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it sounded like uh, you're storing the diabetic information <coughs> online. Um, is that not dangerous for if your app got hacked? They would have access to all of your sort of users' information. That would go along with any health-related application on a phone. Um, that's part of the reason we use the Auth0, because it's more secure that way. Um, and also, there's no way that they could do any harm, because it's not connected to a pump, so they wouldn't be able to um, do anything dangerous with it, other than have that information. Is the uh, data is low point on the phone or is it somewhere else? Uh, it's stored on a database yeah. on a server in the cloud. It's not local. On the cloud. Yeah. Good question. Um, how long did this take you guys? Did you say two years or once we started? So we initially started a lot of research. Um, this project took most of the majority was research. Uh, so about two semesters worth of research and then one semester worth of coding and getting you know the actual app into development. So around two years. <laughs> Why did you decide to use Ionic for developing this? Uh, because it's a cro cross-platform development app. So we only had to write the code once, and it'll work on an Android phone, an iPhone, or even a Windows phone. Cool. Yeah. I know you said you guys can connect it to the Fitbit. Did you consider any other types of devices before picking the Fitbit? We did. Uh, we actually had access to the other devices that were on there, a Misfit and a Spire. Um, but we wanted to start with Fitbit because it's one that most people have. Um, but I think in the future they will be working on connecting other types of devices. Yeah. I was wondering where you go about tracking the stress because I know when you are showing it, you showed that the stress was being tracked, but on the <coughs> bottom tabs it didn't have anywhere to input that, or at least I didn't see it. Right, so stress is kind of one that we've brought into um, play later on as a factor. Um, the stress and um, mental health is kind of something that we do want to implement into Dialogger. But as for right now, we're kind of just dealing with how we can value that type of you know data. Um, for this, you know, for right now, we're doing it from one to three. One being, you know, you're not that stressed. Three being, you know, you're cramming for a final. Um, and two being, you know, an average college day <laughs> for most of us. <laughs> So future on, it will be more, you know, quantified and more um, scalable and data-wise. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, also, some of those devices, like the Spire, um, have a have a stress measurement that you can mm -hmm. pull off of their API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it tracks on um, your breathing patterns. So. So my question as a parent is, um, what kind of devices would a child have to carry? If we 
if this were to implement it, be implemented by the medical appeal. So as a coming from a parent's view, um, when you're when you do have a child and they're diagnosed for me if I was six years old, the parent would be carrying around the phone, obviously. When you're when you're in that younger years, um, your parents keeping track of most of your, you know, health records, your data, you know, when you're six year old you're also not allowed to really hold a needle. <coughs> so you do have to have the parents um, the responsibility does rely more on the parent at that age. But once you know like a user does get a mobile phone, which nowadays it happens pretty early in middle school. Um, we'd hope that they'd be able to take over that responsibility, but like we said, both parent and um, you know diabetic or child can have the app in on their phone at the same time. Thank you all for being here today. Oh, was there one more question? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Guys, knock it out of the park.